Okay, Dr. Finkelstein is going to speak first, and then we're going to take some questions and uh, have a discussion. And for that, we have a, a neutral moderator, <laughs> Professor <laughs> Duncan Kennedy. <laughs> professor Kennedy is the Carter Professor of General <laughs> Jurisprudence at the Law School. He is a leading figure of the legal left, and he teaches a course here at the law school on legal issues involving Israel and Palestine. Uh, Professor Kennedy will now introduce uh, Dr. Finkel. Thank you. Welcome, and you know, what a great crowd. It's fantastic. So Norman Pickelstein, born in 1953, is a political scientist whose primary fields of research are the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the politics of the Holocaust. A graduate of Binghamton University, he received his PhD in political science from Princeton University. He held faculty positions at Brooklyn College, Rutgers University, Hunter College, New York University, and most recently, DePaul University, where he was an assistant professor from 2001 to 2007. On his website, he describes himself at the moment as an independent scholar, one of the highest titles that a person can have, in my opinion. <laughs> He's the author of numerous articles and books, including Image and Reality of the Israel-Palestine Conflict, The Rise and Fall of Palestine, A Personal Account of the Intifada Years, A Nation on Trial, The Goldhagen Thesis and Historical Truth, the Holocaust Industry Reflections on the Exploitation of Jewish Suffering, and Beyond Chutzpah on the Misuse of Anti-Semitism and the Abuse of History. His Wikipedia page is full of interesting information, and I recommend that you have a look at it. <laughs> His current book, about which he will speak today, is on the Israeli invasion of Gaza, and is called This Time We Went Too Far. And I'd like to, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to Harvard Law School. Thank you. Okay, let's try here. Okay, can everyone hear me fairly well? Yes. Okay, good. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. And I see many friends in the audience. When Professor Duncan Kennedy was reciting my books, uh, titles, uh, my editor is right over here, so I'm sure he's thinking in his head, now I remember that, and I remember <laughs> that. And yes, it was very painful to turn my, <laughs> turn my writing into prose. And to that I owe Cyrus Visser, and I see Jack Trumpor, my old friend. But is Sarah Roy here, and I'm not seeing her? Okay, Sarah, and is Daryl Lee here, and I don't see him? Okay, so Daryl too. So many old friends and new ones, and it's a nice opportunity to be here with you. Uh, I want to speak this evening on what happened in Gaza during those 22 days from December 27th to January 18th, and also what's as important, the aftermath of what happened in Gaza. So you can say it's pretty much from the Gaza invasion to the Goldstone Report, uh, what happened during those days. There's always a certain amount of arbitrariness about where to begin. The Goldstone Report essentially begins with the ceasefire that began on June 19, 2008. I'll begin a little earlier because I think the background is important. I'll begin with January 2006 when the Islamic movement won the parliamentary elections and uh, in elections which former President Jimmy Carter called completely honest and fair. He was one of the monitors, the international monitors of those elections. After Hamas emerged victorious from those elections, Israel, backed by the United States and also by the EU, immediately imposed economic sanctions on Hamas and made lifting those sanctions conditional on Hamas recognizing Israel, renouncing violence, and accepting prior agreements. But no comparable demands were put on Israel to recognize the Palestinian right to self-determination. 
No comparable demand was put on Israel to renounce violence, and no comparable demand was put on Israel to accept prior agreements. For example, the roadmap, which Israel effectively negated with the 14 reservations it entered on the roadmap. In June 2007, the United States, Israel, and elements of the former Palestinian government attempted a coup against the elected Hamas government. Hamas foiled the coup, and it ended up taking full control over Gaza. In reaction, Israel tightened the blockade of Gaza, a blockade which Amnesty International now called a flagrant violation of international law and the Goldstone Report later called a possible crime against humanity. The former High Commissioner of Human Rights, Mary Robinson, she visited Gaza during these months, and he, she said, and now I'm quoting her, Gaza's whole civilization has been destroyed. I'm not exaggerating. In June 2008, Hamas and Israel entered into a ceasefire that was brokered by Egypt. And both sides had conditions which had to be met. It was a quid pro quo. Hamas was obliged to cease its rocket attacks against Israel. And Israel was obliged to gradually lift its blockade of Gaza. According to the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and now I'm quoting it, Hamas was careful to maintain the ceasefire. And even according to the most recent report issued by a quasi-government uh, organization, the Israeli Intelligence and Terrorism uh, Center, even according to them, and now I'm quoting them, Hamas enforced the ceasefire on the rogue terrorist organizations with a great deal although not complete success. But whereas Hamas was, again to quote the Israeli foreign ministry, careful to maintain the ceasefire, Israel reneged on its obligation under the terms of the ceasefire to gradually lift the blockade of Gaza. What happened next was chronicled by Amnesty International and now I'm quoting from their annual report. A ceasefire agreed in June between Israel and Palestinian armed groups in Gaza held for four and a half months, but broke down after Israeli forces killed six Palestinian militants in airstrikes and other attacks on November 4th. Still, Hamas was willing to renew the ceasefire we know this from the Israeli internal security chief, Yuval Diskin. He said, Hamas wants to renew the ceasefire. According to the former IDF Israeli military commander in Gaza, Shmuel Zake, Hamas was willing to halt the fire, halt the fire in exchange for an easing of Israeli policies that have, choked, that have kept a chokehold on the Gaza economy. So down till the end of December, Israel had broken the ceasefire, but Hamas was willing to renew it, but only on condition that the original terms for the ceasefire were implemented. Remember, it was a quid pro quo. Israel or Hamas was supposed to stop its rocket attacks. Israel was supposed to gradually lift the blockade, a blockade which as Mary Robinson said, was destroying the civilization in Gaza, a blockade which Amnesty International said was a flagrant violation of international law. But Israel demanded unconditional and unilateral Hamas cessation of rocket fire. In December 2008, Sarah Roy from Harvard, and who's with us this evening, Wrote in, the New York, wrote in the London Review of Books, the breakdown of an entire society is happening in front of us, but there is little international response beyond UN warnings 
which are ignored. Faced with the prospect of an asphyxiating Israeli blockade, even if it ceased firing rockets, forced to choose between what it called starvation and fighting, Hamas opted for resistance, albeit largely symbolic. <coughs> the former IDF commander in Gaza said, you cannot just land blows, leave the Palestinians in Gaza in the economic distress they're in, and expect that Hamas will just sit around and do nothing. The head of Hamas, Khalid Mishal, he wrote in the Guardian newspaper during those 22 days, our modest homemade rockets are our cry of protest to the world. A world, as Sarah Roy said, which knew exactly what was going on, but decided to do nothing. Those who condemn Hamas rocket attacks must show what other option they had. Critics are in effect saying that the people of Gaza had a legal moral obligation to sit still and die. And I'm not familiar with that as any kind of moral obligation under any law. Under, on December 27th, Israel invaded Gaza. And then what ensued were 22 days of what Amnesty International called death and destruction, 22 days of death and destruction. In order to justify the death and destruction in Gaza, Israel and its supporters gestured to the unique challenges Israel confronted in what it called its asymmetrical war with Hamas. And others talked about the fog of war conditions in Gaza. So they said the problem, what accounted for all the death and destruction, was that asymmetrical war, the fog of war conditions. But did Israel engage in a war in Gaza, symmetrical or asymmetrical? After what happened in Gaza, Israel was very pleased. It went around boasting about how it had restored its deterrence capacity because it had inflicted a military defeat on Gaza. It had won the war. And they were very thrilled by that result. But an Israeli strategic analyst, he said, it is very dangerous for Israel to believe it won the war. When there was no war, in reality, not a single battle was fought during the 22 days. A former Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs official, he was quoted as saying, there was no war. Hamas sat in its bunkers and came out when it was all over. There was no war in Gaza. So what did happen in Gaza? Well, the first week, there was an air assault in Gaza. And by the end of the 22 days, Israel had flown uh, 3,000 combat missions over Gaza. Not a single plane was damaged. Not a single plane was downed. Well, that's not too surprising because uh, Hamas had no anti-aircraft defenses. It took as much courage to fly an air mission over Gaza as it does to shoot fish in a barrel. After the first week, Israel launched its air and ground offensive. Israel was equipped with special night fighting equipment. Hamas couldn't even see them. They had no means of even engaging the Israelis. <coughs> 